Hello and warm greetings. Welcome to the Analyst by Vajra Ravi, where we would try to comprehensively analyze nine articles from the Hindu and the Indian Express, especially from the perspective of the upcoming mains exam. In the first article, we'll talk about the restive situation in Balochistan and how badly it is affecting the life of common people there. In the second article, we'll have a discussion with respect to the unified lending interface and how it is going to transform the lending landscape in the country. Next, in the third article, we'll have a discussion with respect to the new meteorological mission, which aims to enhance the weather forecasting ability of the Indian Meteorological Department. Then in the fourth article, we'll have a discussion with respect to the new India Literacy Program and the definitions of literacy which are given by the Ministry of Education. Then in the fifth article, we'll have a discussion with respect to the two new US-India agreements and how they're going to transform the defense partnership. Finally, in the preliminary snippet sections, we'll have a discussion with respect to some of the very important topics for the preliminary exam. Now, the very first article is about the unrest in Balochistan. So what we recently witnessed was that that in three separate incidents, insurgents killed more than 38 people in the Balochistan region of Pakistan. Now, this points towards the restive situation which is there in Balochistan. And what we also have seen is that there have been continued protest movements and especially led by women. Now, this calls for an urgent need of action by the Pakistan's establishment. Now, this is a part of GS2 India and its neighborhood relations. Now, before we talk about this topic, Topic. Let us first talk about what is this Baluchistan region, right? So see, this particular region, it actually spans three countries, that is Pakistan, Afghanistan and Iran. That is if we talk about the region, the Balochistan region, right? And this particular region in Pakistan, that is where we, what we see is that there have been continued violence, that there has been continuous insurgency, right? Now, this particular Balochistan region, it has its own distinct identity identity in terms of the cultural identity the ethnic identity the historical identity right and as i said that it is divided between the three countries of iran afghanistan and pakistan now what you need to keep in mind is that despite being one of the places in Pakistan which has one of the most abundant natural resources, if we talk about the mineral resources, for example, the coal or petroleum or gold or copper, it is one of the most backward regions in the Pakistan. Right. And what we that is the reason what we see, what we saw that there have been regular protest movements and the recent protest movement, which was led by the Baloch Yagjati committee. Now, this was actually it wanted to talk about the human rights violations which are being carried out in Balochistan. It wanted to talk about the economic exploitation which is being carried out in the Baloch region. And it also wanted to raise up the issue with respect to the government's inability to provide the basic amenities to the people of the Baloch region. Right now, again, as this protest continued, what happened was that, that it resulted into the clashes and the establishment, the police authorities, they suppressed, they brutally suppressed the protesters, right? Now, again, what you need to keep in mind is that these protest movements and the atrocities committed by the police establishment, it has led to sharp increase in the price of necessities. For example, petrol, for example, medicines, for example, food. Now, this overall has badly affected the life of common people, right? So you can see this is the Baloch part in the Pakistan and just see that it comprises almost 44% of the total area of Pakistan, right? Now, let us go into the historical context. See, Baloch region has a history of political turmoil, right? It was in the year of 1947 when the Khan of Kalat, he actually declared the independence in 1947 but Pakistan through its own tactics through its own pressure tactics it actually through the instrument of accession it integrated Baloch region as a part of its own territory right but what we saw was that that it was in the year of 1955 where the Pakistan implemented the one unit scheme now see what was this one unit scheme what Pakistan did was that it integrated the western part of the country. So you just see over here, we have got the western part of the country. Different ethnicities, different regions were actually clubbed into one single unit. And that obviously led to mistrust among the people. It obviously led to the feeling that the government is not interested into the well-being of the people. Right. So again, what happened was that because of the resistance, this scheme was finally abolished in 1970. And provincial assemblies were given in these different states of Pakistan. But what we saw that the true principles of federalism were not followed, right? Now, again, what you need to keep in mind is that over here, you have one of the very important port cities, and that is Gwadar, right? Now, this is geopolitically very important area. We'll come to this why. Now, this port of Gwadar, initially, it was actually a part of the Sultanate of Oman, right? And it was in the year of 1958 that Pakistan purchased it from 
the Oman, right? Now, again, what we need to keep in mind is that this particular place, Gwadar, it has been the source of tension and also with respect to India because China is implementing a lot of energy projects, a lot of investments are being made in different domains, in ports, in this particular Gwadar port. Now, this is a part of China's CPEC, China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. Right now, this China Pakistan economic corridor it basically starts from Kashgar in China, it traverses through the Pakistan and then it ends at Gwadar. Right, and this also traverses through the illegally Pakistan occupied territory of India and therefore it affects India's sovereignty. Right, so what we need to keep in mind is that there are a lot of reasons, and the local people, the local population is not satisfied with the kind of developmental projects which are being taken by the government and by the Chinese agencies in particular. Now, talking about the root causes of the unrest, see, as I told in the beginning, that there is sort of an economic exploitation which is being carried out, and especially by these Chinese firms. So what we need to keep in mind is that it has 44% of the country's landmass, but it has only 4.5% of the Pakistan's GDP and 4% of its national electricity consumption. Can you imagine a particular area which has 44% of the landmass and it is just consuming 4% of the electricity consumption, right? So just think about the deprivation, the, the kind of conditions, the bad conditions which pe where people live in, right? Next is lack of provincial autonomy as we discussed. So Pakistan has never given full autonomy to these states and time and again Islamabad controls over Baluchistan and different states that has increased and that has led to fueling discontent among the people of Baluchistan. Next is that control over the resources also. So Pakistan has been controlling the local resources the local natural resources of Balochistan and this obviously is fueling discontent among the people. Next is human rights violations. Now, Pakistan has been carrying out the counter-insurgency operations in these particular areas. And these counter-insurgency operations, they include the enforced disappearances. And ultimately, these enforced disappearances of people have resulted into the fake encounters or extrajudicial killings. Right? According to a civil society group, that is the voice of Baloch missing peoples, what it says is that almost 7,000 people 7,000 people have been actually killed from 2002 till 2024. Can you imagine? Now, this is a huge number, right? Next is China's role, as we just talked about. That there are concerns, serious concerns with respect to... See, there are concerns with respect to India, obviously, because it is hurting India's sovereignty. But even in Balochistan, there are concerns with respect to the local people over there. Because what China is doing is, China is investing in the coastline areas, in the long coastline which the Balochistan province has, and it is actually acquiring a lot of land masses. Now, this is affecting the livelihood of the locals in the Balochistan. Moreover, China is using trawlers for fishing. Now, this is affecting the local fishing community over there, right? Next is that there is a potential scenario where the Chinese firms can militarize or the PLA, the Chinese People Liberation Army, it can militarize the Gwadar port. Now, if it happens, it would be a grave security threat for India. And also, it would provide China the ability to project its power in the very strategic Gulf of Oman and Persian Gulf. Now, can you tell me that we have a very important Strait of Hormuz? The Strait of Hormuz is between which two countries? Do write in the comment section, right? Now, what should be the way forward, right, in this particular crisis? The first and foremost is that there has to be local stakeholder participation. See, what Pakistani establishment is doing is that they are focusing upon very few big ticket infra projects in this particular region, right? But they are not focusing upon the livelihood generation opportunities for the local people, right? So they have to give adequate resources. They have to make sure that there is relative autonomy in this particular region so that people can have their own livelihood opportunities. Next is provincial autonomy. Very important. True principles of federalism need to be actually followed in this particular area. The Islamabad establishment should keep in mind that it should not time and again restrict the freedom of the people over there. It should not time and again make the people realize that they are subordinate to the Pakistani establishment, right? So there has to be adequate provincial autonomy. Next is respecting human rights. Very important. So these cases of the enforced disappearances, they have to be done away with. 
there has to be proper scrutiny of such instances and we need to actually watch over the different human rights organization actually make sure that the Pakistani establishment does not use this particular enforced disappearance as a part of its counterinsurgency operation. Next, there has to be dialogue and reconciliation. See, this is the way forward. If you want, see, ultimately, again and again, if whenever people revolt, there comes a situation where the authority has to yield. So we have to provide a sort of a transitional process where the Pakistani establishment can slowly start give the relative autonomy to the people of the Balochistan and then there can be the full transition to a democratic setup. Next is respecting the ethnic identities. Very important. What the Pakistani establishment needs to keep in mind is that we have different ethnicities in different areas in Pakistan and they should not club into one particular entity, right? So relative autonomy has to be provided to these ethnic communities as well. Next is addressing the challenges posed by China's involvement in the region. Now, this is very important because China, what China has been doing is what local people say is that despite being a more, more than a decade, the fruits of the development projects which are being carried out by the Chinese firms, they have not given adequate results. And instead, it is affecting the livelihoods of the local communities. So there needs to be a check on what the Chinese firms are doing. Again, what we see is that the Pakistani establishment is very much complexly related to the Chinese. And there are allegations of corruptions also, right? So what the Chinese establishment, again, if the Pakistani establishment doesn't work upon that, there would be serious consequences. And these instances of insurgence, of killing of people, this would remain unresolved, right? So again, what we need to make sure is that this should not spill across Pakistan's border, that is to India, and the situation should be normalized. And over here, what the Pakistani establishment should do is that it should make efforts to provide autonomy to the provinces, especially to the Balochistan province and make sure that the returns, that the economic progress of the country can only be achieved if the provinces develop, right? So that is what you need to know about this particular article. Now, before we go to the next topic, we have a main question. So the question says, analyze the historical, political, economic and social factors contributing to the ongoing unrest in Balochistan, Pakistan, suggest potential solutions to address the grievances of the Baloch people and promote peace and stability in the region. So do write a particular answer. To this question. So the next article is with respect to the unified lending interface. So the Reserve Bank of India's governor has said that there would be the launch of the unified lending interface. Now this is going to be on the lines of the unified payment interface, the UPI, which has transformed the ecosystem, that is the ecosystem of the retail payments in India. And this is going to transform the lending landscape in the country. So we'll see what this ULI is all about. Now this is a part of GS2, Government Policies and Interventions for the Development in Various Sectors. And and GS3, Inclusive Growth and Science and Technology. Now, see, please understand that whenever we have, we talk about the digital credit delivery, it depends on the data. That is, there has to be the transfer of data from one source to the other for the credit appraisal of the borrower, right? But what we see is that there are a lot of entities which are involved in this particular process. For example, we have got the central government. For example, we have the, we have the state governments. We have the credit information companies. We have got the account aggregators. We have the banks. We have got the other financial ins institutions. So there, the data is in silos, right? It is in separate entities. Different entities have their own set of data, right? Now, this creates the issue. Issue with respect to the hindrance in the delivery of credit that is timely credit and making sure that the credit delivery process is efficient right now what has to be the solution right so the solution lies in the digital public infrastructure see what we have been witnessing over the years almost a decade is that that the government has been focusing upon strengthening the digital public infrastructure now what is digital public infrastructure see it comprises of the range of technologies and the platforms which we use for example we have got the cloud computing for example we have got the digital identity identifiers platforms for example we have got the broadband connectivity right so all these things make up the digital public infrastructure so as to make sure that different governments we have got the businesses we have got the startups we have got the individuals they can access the internet and then they can ultimately get the benefit of these digital services now one more reason why the government of india is focusing upon this digital public infrastructure is that that it is aiming to transform the digital economy setup in the country and it aims to cross the 1 trillion mark the 1 trillion mark by the year 
right so that is what the aim of the government is all about now a part of this digital public infrastructure is the india stack now this is an application programming interface which includes many things for example the aadhaar enable payment system the bharat qr code the upi that is a unified payment interface or the immediate payment system that is imps or the e kyc that is a e know your customer and then we have got the aadhaar pay so these are some of the components of the digital payment infrastructure right so this particular scheme which the rbi is going to bring this particular project that is the unified lending interface it is also going to be one of the e apis in this particular digital public infrastructure now what is this unified lending interface as i said that this would facilitate the seamless and consent based flow of digital information through various entities central government state government right or account aggregators the banks the financial institutions next as i said it would flow the information from multiple data service providers to the lenders now again the objective is that there has to be reduction in the credit appraisal time especially for the rural borrowers or those borrowers who need very small amount of money see again we have got a large segment of the population which needs a very small amount of money right which needs a very small am amount of money when we talk about the loans right but even that amount is not being being able to disburse to these particular people so over here what is important is that there has to be a proper channel of transfer of the digital information so that timely and adequate credit can be given to these small borrowers next this particular uli that is a unified lending interface it would have common and standardized apis that is application programming interfaces and it would be based on plug and play approach so that different entities can use and can access the information the digital information anywhere right so that is based on the plug and play approach now what are the key features of this unified lending interface the first is loan comparison that is it would provide the ability to the customers to so that they can compare the various loan pro products which are been given by different financial institutions right so the customer would be in a better position to make an informed choice next is online application that is the whole process is online that is fr starting from the submission of the documents to the final credit disbursal the whole process is online right there is no manual intervention next is document uploading that is even the uploading of the document is in the online format right and thus it would make sure that there is no fudging of data next is loan tracking the customers can actually access that to which what is the status of their loan application right to which stage their loan application has reached and finally whether it has been approved or not next is personalized recommendation this particular uli would be in a position to give the information with respect to what the need of a borrower are basis the profile the financial profile of the borrower basis the needs of the borrower right now what are the expected benefits the first is improved customer experience that is it would automatically take less time for the particular uli to disburse the credit then it would result into more efficient and more user friendly experience right next is the increased financial inclusion again small borrowers rural borrowers would be able to access more credit product products right so that would automatically lead to the enhanced financial inclusion that is more and more unbanked areas or underbanked areas would have the access to adequate credit next is reduce cost of lending see please understand that if we have got many players who are who would be actually joining this uli that would automatically lead to a more competitive space and that competition would usher in a scenario where the loan products are actually are more economical for the common people right therefore it would lead to the reduction in the cost of lending next is enhanced competition as i said so more and more number of people more and more number of lenders would join this uli platform and it would automatically usher in the competitive spirits and then it would lead to more affordable products right now what are the challenges and considerations with respect to this particular platform the first and foremost is the data security see this uli platform would handle a lot of data right and therefore there is the issue of data fudging or data leakage right so uh, adequate attention has to be paid to the data security framework next is integration with lenders so the uli platform would have to make sure that different lenders across the spectrum the financial spectrum they are able to access this particular uli right then the user experience 
adequate literacy ha ha will have to be provided to the common customers to the customers so that they can access this particular product so that they can make sure that how to use this particular platform right next is regulatory compliances in terms of the data production law in terms of the financial regulations so the ULI would have to make sure that it is in line with the regulatory structure so what we see is that like the UPI as it transformed the retail payment uh, ecosystem in the country the ULI is also expected to transform the lending landscape in the country right so it remains to be seen what the results of ULI would be but adequate funds and adequate impetus should be given to this particular projects so that it can actually lead to these following benefits so that is what you need to know about this particular unified lending interface now before we go to the next topic we have a question so the question says the unified lending interface is expected to revolutionize the lending landscape as unified payment interface transform the retail payment systems elaborate so do write a particular answer on this question so the next topic is with respect to the metrological mission so recently the government of india has said that it is going to launch a new mission which is worth 10000 crores in special reference to the indian metrological department so that it can give more accurate weather predictions more accurate weather forecasting in reference to the extreme weather events and the local predictions right now this is with respect to gs1 geography and gs3 environment and climate change see especially after 2012 when the indian government implemented the monsoon mission the forecasting ability of the indian meteorological department it significantly improved now before i go ahead you have to tell me that under which department does the indian meteorological department comes right so under which ministry sorry the indian meteorological department comes so do write in the comment section now what we saw was that that after the monsoon mission was implemented in the year 2012 there was significant increase in the weather forecasting ability of the indian meteorological department but as of now what we see is that when it comes to the specific events or when it comes to the short lived events the forecasting ability or the the results of the forecast they are not accurate and a particular research which is carried out by the indian express it shows that in the month of july with reference to the mumbai rainfalls the predictions of the indian meteorological department were off the mark by more than 40% right so this points towards the need of having a robust weather forecasting mechanism now please understand that the science of weather forecasting it is full of uncertainties and these uncertainties increase as you go into the specific locations if you want to know about a particular specific location the weather forecast of that location definitely the uncertainties would increase or if you want to know about a very short lived event within one or two hours span of time then definitely the uncertainties would increase so what we see see is that especially in in the last decade or in the last two decades there has been human induced climate change and that has led to the increase in extreme weather events the frequency the intensity the erratic nature of these extreme weather events has increased and that has resulted into in most cases widespread damage you can take the example of the recent kerala floods or you can take the example of the glacial lake outburst floods which happened in sikkim right and uttarakhand so these if we don't have the adequate and this is the reason the reason is that we don't have the adequate forecasting ability we don't have the adequate information with respect to that particular event and that is resulting into the widespread damage now what it requires is generating effective forecasts and establishing the early warning systems right and that can only happen if we invest a substantial amount of money in this money and resources in this particular weather forecasting ability of the indian meteorological department now the as i said the budget of this particular mission is around 10000 crores what you need to keep in mind is the previous mission as i said the monsoon mission which was launched in 2012 it focused upon the infra that is increasing the number of instruments or increasing the compute the the computing power of the machines right but this particular project it focuses upon more accurate computer simulation models now these computer simulations model would integrate the climate change scenarios right so climate change scenarios would guide this particular simulation that yes a particular event can occur in this particular location at that particular time right again the focus is on extreme weather as i said the intensity the frequency and the erratic nature has increased therefore the focus is obviously on the extreme weather events now how the focus would be through accurate forecasts and the early warning systems now 
there has been an important focus upon the technological interventions in this particular mission for example as i said the simulation models then we have got the strengthening of the weather monitoring networks and deploying more advanced weather satellites see as of now the indian meteorological department is dependent upon three satellites so we have got the inset 3d we have got the inset 3dr and we have got the inset 3ds right now in these three satellites out of these three satellites two satellites that is inset 3d and inset 3d r they have almost reached to their end of life right so what the mission is trying to say is that we would need a new series of satellites most probably the inset 4 right so this series would help us to give us more precision information more range of information it would help us to give it give us more high resolution pictures of the weather events so that we would be able to make more accurate predictions now next is integration of artificial intelligence and machine learning so this particular mission is it is also trying to focus upon integrating the artificial intelligence and machine learning so as to make sure that the simulations are more specific so the simulations give us the right projections with respect to a particular area or with respect to a particular extreme weather event right and again as i said the word being used here is the hyper local rainfall uh, forecast that is the rainfall forecast with respect to a very small particular area right or the rainfall projections with respect to an a particular event within a very short span of time right so what is the importance of the improved forecasting the first is that if we have got timely and adequate information then it can result it into preventive measures that is disaster mitigation so it helps us to mitigate the disasters so adequate information timely information is needed to prevent such events from happening such widespread damage from happening then it also reduces the impact of disasters for example landslides for example the floods next is economic benefits that is timely forecast give the information to different stakeholders be it the business businesses be it the government be it the individuals and then they can plan their activities accordingly next it also reduces the economic losses because if a person is able to plan his or her economic activity on a prior basis then obviously it would lead to lower economic losses right but if someone is planning a particular economic activity and if such event happens then it would lead to the loss of economic resources then public safety it obviously leads to the saving of lives and property now what should be the way forward the first and foremost is the increased investments that is adequate investments have to be made in the weather forecasting infrastructure as we are witnessing as the government is trying to do that it is focusing upon the forecasting abilities of the indian meteorological department next is technological innovations so as we said that initially in 2012 the monsoon mission focused upon just increasing the number of machines or making sure that the computational power is increasing but now what we are trying to focus upon is integrating different technologies artificial intelligence machine learning right computer simulations so that is the need of the art next is collaborating with other countries and meteorological organizations so that we can learn from their best best practices so so that we can learn from their experiences and then integrate it, their own setups what they are trying to do integrate that particular setup in our own climate projections next is public awareness people need to be made aware with respect to the climate forecasting so that they can actually plan their activities so adequate information has to be disseminated to the people so what we see is that this particular mission is going to be very important especially considering that there has been an increasing human induced climate change and that has resulted into the increase in the erratic nature of these events also there has been sudden increase in the extreme weather events we are witnessing in kerala we have witnessed in uh, sort of the sikkim last year so adequate investments have to be made and this mission is actually focusing upon that and it remains to be seen what the end results of this particular mission would be right so that is what you need to know about this particular article now before going to the next topic we have a main question so the question says critically analyze the challenges faced by india's weather forecasting capabilities particularly in predicting the extreme weather events evaluate the proposed measures to enhance these weather forecasting capabilities in india so do write a particular answer on this question so the next topic is with respect to the new india literacy program so the ministry of education has given guidelines with respect to the definition of literacy and what does full literacy means now this is in line with this particular program that is new india literacy program now, now this is with respect to gs2 issues relating to the development and management of social sector and welfare schemes now see 
This particular program, it is basically a centrally sponsored scheme, right? Where you have got specific contribution by the central government and specific contribution by the state government. And it is from the year financial year 2022-23 till 2026-27. Now, with the financial total financial outlay of 1037 crores. Now, please understand, as I said, it's a centrally sponsored scheme. So around 700 crores are being given by the central government and the rest 337 crores are being given, given by the state governments. So do remember this. Now, what this program aims is to actually cover a target of 5 crore non-literates in the age group of 15 years and above. So it in aims to enhance, to increase the literacy of more than 5 crore people in this particular time period from financial year 22-23 till financial year 26-27. Now, this particular scheme has five components the first is the foundational literacy and numeracy then we have got the critical life skills then we have got the vocational skills development then the basic education and then continuing education now what you need to understand is that this particular scheme it is majorly it is primarily based on online format right that is the beneficiaries are identified on the mobile app so we have got the door to door survey which are carried out by the state governments and through a particular mobile app we have got the identification of the beneficiaries now the non-literates can also directly register on this particular mobile app. Then the scheme is mainly based on volunteerism. That is, it is asking people to contribute to volunteer in teaching and making sure that there is enhancement in the literacy levels around the country. Then the teaching learning material resources are available on the digital initiative on knowledge sharing. That is a portal which provides the learning resources in more than more than 30 languages in different languages to the people that is freely right and it is a basically a platform of the ncrt now other modes are also there that is tv radio samajik chetna kendra and which are to be used in enhancing the literacy levels around the country now it is under this particular scheme that the ministry of education has given guidelines with respect to the literacy definition so again according to the guidelines which are given by the uh, ministry of education what it says is that how it defines literacy is that the ability to read, write, compute with comprehension, that is to identify, understand, interpret and create along with critical life skills such as digital and financial literacy, right? So it is also incorporating, integrating the aspects of digital and financial literacy. Next, full literacy to be considered equivalent to 100% literacy will be achieving 95% literacy in a state or union territory. So that is what you need to know about this particular article. That is New India Literacy Program and the definitions of literacy which are given by the Ministry of Education. Now, before we go to the next topic, we have a very important prelims question. So, the question says, consider the following, Arogya Setu, Coven, DigiLocker and Diksha. So, we just discussed what, what Diksha was all about. So, Diksha is what? Digital Initiative for Knowledge Sharing. Now, this is this particular soft, uh, platform by the NCRT. It is open source, right? So, it is an open source platform. Now, you need to tell me that which of the above are built on top of the open source digital platforms. The first is the 1 and 2 only. The second is 2, 3, 4 only. The third is 1, 3, 4 only. And the D is 1, 2, 3, 4 only. Right. That is all. Sorry. So you need to tell me which of the following is the correct answer. Do write in the comment section. So the next article is with respect to the two new US India agreements that is in special reference to the defense partnerships. So the first agreement is security of supply arrangement. And the second agreement is about memorandum of agreement with respect to the assignment of liaison officers, right? So what we see is that there has been increasing defense partnership when it comes to India and the US, and it remains to be seen what and how these defense agreements are going to enhance the security of both India and the US. Now, this is with respect to GS2 bilateral, regional and global groupings and agreements involving India. Now, talking about the first agreement that is security of supply arrangement. See, we have this particular defense agreement. Now, this actually focuses upon one important word and that is priority, right? That is the defense establishment of these two countries need to prioritize the need of the other country, right? So if India is asking for certain defense items from the US, it has to be prioritized by the US. And if US is asking for some items, some goods and services, that is defense goods and services from India. So India should, Indian establishment should prioritize those actually for the US. So it mandates the US and the India to provide reciprocal priority support for goods and services that promote national defense. Next, it resolves the unanticipated supply chain disruptions to meet the national security needs. So 
what we see is that there have been frequent disruptions to the global supply chains and it is also happening with the defense trades. So this arrangement would make sure that there is a minimal disruption to the supply chains when it comes to the defense goods and product. Next, India is the 18th country, 18th par partner of the US with respect to this particular deal. So US already has deals this particular arrangement with 17 other countries. So we have got, for example, the country like Australia, Canada, Denmark, Estonia, Finland, Israel, Italy, Japan, UK and other countries. Key factor and this particular arrangement is going to be a key factor in strengthening the defense trade and technology initiative. So you must keep in mind that India and US have a particular initiative known as the Defense Technology and Trade Initiative. Now this provides the ability to both countries to reduce the bureaucratic hurdles and make sure that the defense trade is carried on very efficiently. So this particular event, it's, it's this particular arrangement, it, it's, it's a commitment to support one another's priority delivery requests for procurement of critical national defense sources. And this would make it easier for the Indian companies to get priority supplies from the US and revitalize the defense industry cooperation between the two countries. See, please understand that India's defense exports have been increasing. And you must know that US is also one of the buyers of defense products, right? So that is the reason that see India has been dependent on the US defense materials, US defense platforms, but US is also sourcing some of the defense items from India. Therefore, this particular arrangement becomes very important. What you need to keep in mind is that this is not legally binding and it is not sanction proofed. The second arrangement is about the memorandum of agreement on the liaison officers. So this basically points towards that we would have posting of the defense officers on a reciprocal basis. That is progress on earlier. It's a progress on the earlier decision between the two sides to increase the sharing of information between India and the US and will entail the posting of Indian armed forces officers in the key strategic US command. This is primarily aimed to enhance the interoperability to know that yes, to be comfortable with what and how the processes of US defense forces are carried out and in what ways the Indian defense forces carry out their own processes, right? So India would deploy its first liaison officer to the headquarters of Special Operations Command in Florida. So you need to keep a track of these two agreements because UPSC has definitely asked questions with respect to other foundational agreements, which we would soon discuss. Now coming to the prelim snippet section, we have got the first article as the initiative on critical and emerging technologies. So as we just discussed that India and US have been focusing upon increasing the defense partnership. And one of the core components of this partnership is the initiative on critical and emerging technology. See, we all know that there is a great focus upon the new, the critical and new emerging technologies. We have got the artificial intelligence, we have got the cloud computing, the supercomputing. So that is where th what we are witnessing is a greater interaction between India and US when it comes to these critical and emerging technologies. So through the initiative, through this particular initiative, India and US have unveiled a roadmap for enhanced collaboration in high technology areas. For example, we have got the artificial intelligence. For example, we have the quantum computing. We have got the semiconductor, we have got the supercomputing, we have got the wireless uh, communications. So in this particular area, what we would see is a greater interaction between India and the US. What you need to keep in mind is that this particular initiative, it is being carried out by the National Security Council of both the countries. The National Security Council is carrying out this particular initiative and focus is on collaboration and co-development. So the benefits so that the benefits of these projects can be actually shared by both the countries and they can actually strengthen the overall national security architecture of these two respective countries. So that is what you need to know about the initiative on critical and emerging technologies. Now, the next topic is with respect to the four foundational agreements. This is a very important topic and UPSC has focused upon these foundational agreements because that serves as the backbone of the defense partnership between India and the US, right? So this is in the context of India and the US. So the first in 2002, India and the US had signed the General Security of Military Information Agreement to facilitate the sharing of military information, that is GSOMIA. Then we had the Logistic Exchange of Memorandum of Agreement in the year 2016 and it established the basic terms, conditions and procedures for reciprocal provisions of logistic supports, supplies and services between the two militaries. Then in 2018, we have got the Communications Compatibility and Security Agreement, that is COMCASA. Now, this is an India-specific version of the Communications and Information Security Memorandum of Ar Agreement, right? So this is, we have got the SISMO, and out of this SISMO, we have got the Indian variant, that is COMCASA. Now, this was signed to secure 
the military communications between the two countries. So we it focuses upon the military communication between the two countries, facilitate the access to the advanced defense system, and enable India to optimally utilize its existing US origin platforms. Then what we had in 2020 was that basic exchange of cooperation agreement. It aimed to facilitate the sharing of military information, including maps, nautical charts, and other unclassified imagery and data. Finally, in 2019, we had the industrial security annex to GSOMIA, which was signed to facilitate the exchange of classified information between the defense industries of the two countries. So this industrial security annex, it was basically to integrate the industries, the defense industries in this information sharing mechanism. So this is very important. You need to keep a track of these four foundational agreements. So that is it, what you need to know about these agreements. Now the next topic is with respect to the Southeast Asia mapping. See, UPSC has had a record of asking questions with respect to the geographical locations around the planet. So this becomes really important. Now in this particular article, there was a focus upon the Singapore. So the country of Singapore lies here, right? So just remember that. Now there are very important geographical locations here. For example, we have got the Strait of Malacca. This is very important. So the Strait of Malacca is a very important strategic choke point. It's in special reference to the Chinese export and import, Chinese exim, right? Next, we have got the island of Sumatra. So this is the island of Sumatra. We have got the Java here, the island of Java. And this small, what you see over here, it is the island of Bali, Bali. So do remember, right? There are important straits. We have got the Sunda Strait between Sumatra and Java, and we have got the Lombok Strait here. Right. Over here, we have got the Gulf of Thailand. We have got the Gulf of Thailand. And here, we have got the Gulf of Tonkin. Tonkin, important. And here, this is the Henan Island. Right. Henan, which is a part of China. Here, we have got the Taiwanese Strait. Coming to the water bodies, we have got the Celebs Sea here the Sulu see here and we have got the Flores see here over here we have got the Java Sea right so these are the important locations as I said we have got the Sumatra Island we have got the Java Island we have got the Bali Island then we have got the Strait of Malacca then we have got the Gulf of Thailand that we have got the Gulf of Tonkin Henan Island then we have got the Sunda Strait and then Lombok Strait and the other water bodies, for example, the Flores Sea, the Celeb Sea, the Sulu Sea, right? So keep a track of these geographical positions. It may, might be important for the UPSC exam. Now, the next topic is with respect to the Northeast, India and Myanmar. Now, this particular geographical locations become really important because what we are witnessing is that there is a very serious situation in Myanmar. There has been the rise of ethnic armed organizations, right? There has been, for example, we have got the Arakan Army, or we have got the Brotherhood Alliance, right? Or we have got the Kachin Independence Army, right? So this becomes important because this is spilling on the Indian side. See, please understand that India and Myanmar share a border, land border of around 1,643 kilometers. And we have got the state of Arunachal, which shares around 520, which then we have got the Nagaland, then we have got Manipur, and then we have got Mizoram. What you need to keep in mind is that there are some tribes which are actually common on both the sides. For example, what we see is that we have a lot of Nagas which live on both the sides of the border. We have got in Manipur a particular community which is the Cookies. Cookies. Cookies share a relation, a tribal relation with the Zo. Zo community in Myanmar. That is primarily in the Chin state. So we have got the Chin state here. Right. So in the Chin state, what we see is we have got the Zo community and that shares a tribal relation with the Cookies. Now in Manipur, you must know that there was some tension between the Cookies and the dominant Maithis. Right. So therefore, it led to a lot of stripes, conflicts. Again, we also have got the Mizos. We have got the Mizos who share the cultural linkages with the Zo community. Right. So we have got the tribes who the similar tribes, the common tribes, which are on the both sides of the border. Now, again, why this becomes important is that there has been there has been a report by various investigative agencies that there can be balkanization of Myanmar. That is, Myanmar can break into pieces because we have got ethnic armed organizations, as I just said. For example, we have got the Brotherhood Alliance, which has captured a lot of military outposts and it has taken different positions from the grip of military right then we have got the Kachan independence army it has taken over the trade routes which go into the china then we have got in the rakhine state the arakan army arakan army now this is a radical buddhist ethnic armed organization and that has actually captured a lot of positions now this becomes really important now can you just tell me 
what is the name of the port which the Chinese have in Myanmar, right? For example, we have got the Sitwe port, which India is developing. So we have got the Kaladan multimodal transit pro projects, which runs from the Kolkata via the sea, it goes to the Sitwe port, and then it goes to the northeastern part of the country, right? So it comes from the Kolkata part, and it goes to the Sitwe, and then it goes to the northeastern part of the country. Now, can you tell me the name of the city where Chinese have heavily invested in Myanmar, the name of the port city, right? So what you need to keep a track of is that these are the important locations. We have got this particular tribes who live on both the sides of the border. And this can be important for your prelims exam. I hope you really enjoyed the session. All the best. Thank you.